You're listening to the Smith House Adventure Show. Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Brian Smith. Today's guest is Captain Owen McIntyre. Owen started his career with the Royal Westminster Regiment, a primary reserve light infantry unit in British Columbia, Canada, doing a tour on Roto 3 in 2007 to Afghanistan, earning the rank of sergeant before joining the Royal Canadian Air Force as a pilot, who has earned his wings and has been posted to 440 Squadron in Yellowknife, Northwest Territories. Owen, welcome. Thanks a lot, Brian. It's good to be here. Oh, thank you very much. So, what parts of your childhood do you attribute to laying down the foundations of the man you are today? And was there any special someone who nurtured your path into the military? Um, yeah, so my dad was a firefighter. So growing up, uh, you know, serving the community and things like that was always definitely something that was kind of at the forefront of our family. And uh, both of my grandfathers actually served in the Royal Canadian Air Force during World War II. And uh, my grandfather's brother actually served uh, alongside him, but he ended up uh, being shot down over Belgium and killed along with his crew. And uh, I can go into a little bit more of that uh, later on when it becomes more relevant. But um, yeah, so I always kind of grew up with uh, that kind of in our family. And growing up, for whatever reason, I was always kind of attracted to, uh, say, policing or the military kind of in movies and things like that. And uh, yeah, it always just kind of interests me, interested me playing cops and robbers and all that kind of stuff as a kid growing up. Um, so as I grew older, uh, when I got into high school, you know, I kind of more seriously started looking at it and checking things out online. And then, uh, I was playing rugby in high school all throughout, uh, grade eight to 12. And then grade 11, one of the grade twelves that I was playing with, um, he was with the 15 field artillery in Vancouver. And, you know, when I found that out, I started asking him a lot of questions cause I was thinking of joining the reg force and things like that. And he basically suggested to me, uh, hey, why don't you try the reserves? Because uh, I hadn't really considered it. He's like, you know, you get to pick where you go, when you go, uh, what you're going to be doing. And if you don't like it, you know, you can just get out. It's a lot easier than, say, signing on for a four-year contract. Uh, it's just a lot more flexible. And I could do it while still in high school. And so that's kind of what led me into it. And uh yeah, uh, 16th of September, 2004, uh, like five days after my 17th birthday is when I actually got sworn into the Royal Westminster Regiment. Now, because the person that was talking to you was artillery, did you have any idea as a kid or anything that you were going to choose infantry or did it just kind of come up and you're like, you know what, I like infantry? I think I was always uh, predisposed to go that way just because of the movies and media and that sort of thing. You know, you want to be the guy at the forefront uh, using all the weapons and be uh, a part of the, the group that the movies are always kind of focused on, right? Because they typically focus on the infantry soldiers. You know, I remember going to watch um, uh, Saving Private Ryan with my dad uh, when it first came out. And I was probably a little bit young to go see that movie, but... Uh, when it first came out, but uh, yeah, that opening Omaha beach scene and the infantry storming the beach and all that. And it was just like, it was pretty mind blowing. Right. And, uh, and then the whole movie kind of focused in on the infantry guys and uh, what they were doing. So that's kind of just where I was always kind of uh, geared towards, I think. Okay. Um, infantry fun times or flying. Which is the one that made you really feel like you can't believe you're getting paid for this? And which one is the most carefree for being able to have that fun? Uh, so both. I wouldn't trade either one, um, to be honest. Uh, sorry, what was the first part of your question there? Which, which one was? Uh... So like infantry blowing everything up, like the good yeah. times of infantry. Because again, yeah, yeah. there can be some real horrible oh, times yeah, of yeah, infantry. Yeah. So oh, the yeah. best moments of infantry or being able to fly, like which one has the most kind of carefree ability to enjoy that fun without so much of the responsibility, maybe that responsibility is on someone else and you just get to have the fun with it. So I would say right now, the infantry definitely had more carefree kind of fun of, you know, shooting stuff, blowing things up, using the weapon systems, uh, learning how to employ them and stuff like that. I mean, there's always that uh, things had to be safe and that sort of thing, right? However, with uh, with flying, 
you know, all my flying right now has pretty much been uh, in a school environment, right? In a training environment. So at all times, every decision you make, uh, everything you're doing is being closely scrutinized by your, uh, your CFI, your qualified flying instructor. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's a little bit more, it's, it's quite stressful. Like those, those flights are only an hour, hour and a half, uh, maybe two hours as things go on. But, you know, you're constantly, uh, assessing your decisions, thinking about what's coming up next. Uh, it's, it's a lot more, uh, kind of intensive in, uh, just, trying to make sure you're doing everything that you're supposed to be doing to ensure that you don't fail a flight or marge a flight and that sort of thing. So it's a little less carefree when you're in that school environment. But, um, you know, like on the phase two on the Harvard, we would get to do some solo flights where you could go do aerobatics and that sort of thing by yourself in the plane or go do a, a land navigation route by yourself where you're 500 feet above the ground going 220 knots. It was pretty cool. Uh, it was tons <laughs> of fun. But, uh, you know, there's not too many moments where you're totally carefully just flying around, right? Like you have goals of what your flight's going to consist of and what you want to achieve in practice. So there's a lot of thinking to it. You know, you, you always have to remind yourself to take a second stop, look outside the window and be like, okay, this is pretty cool. And remind yourself to do it in that when you're doing that. But, uh, with the infantry, it's a little, a little bit easier. Cause again, you're, you're with a bunch of your buddies as well. Everyone's right there. And, uh, you you know you're having making jokes having a good time uh whereas flying is a little bit more of a solo thing but now that i'm multi-engine it's in a crew environment so even on our phase three uh multi-engine training uh you got to do a couple of mutual flights where it's just you and another flight student where you go take off and you go to another airport do a practice approach and then do a touch and go at another airport then come back to base type thing so that flight was actually a ton of fun where it's just you and your buddy and you're just you know you're acting as a team but there's no instructor keeping close tabs on you so you feel a little bit more room to you know if you make a mistake it's not such a big deal like you catch each other on it and just make sure you sort it out right so going forward i think that what flying is going to be like going forward is going to be a little bit more uh enjoyable where you're just working and you're just getting the flight done and you know there's always uh, we're always going to do like an after action kind of a uh, review of the flight talk about what went well what we need to improve what we can work on next time but uh, it's not going to be quite as intensive of, uh, you know, you make one wrong mistake uh, that takes, you know, a second or two to make. And suddenly you just went from passing the flight to not passing it or getting a marginal grade, which is uh, not great either. Mm -hmm. So going back to the infantry, what was your workup training like and uh, what tasks did you have within the platoon while you were on uh, deployment? Yeah, so workup training uh, for us began in uh, the spring of 2006. Um, basically, we got selected from 39 Brigade. There was about a full platoon, 30-ish uh, of us. I can't remember the exact number off the top of my head. Who went from 39 Brigade in BC to 3rd Battalion Charlie Company in Edmonton. And uh, basically, workup training was, I'd say it felt like almost every month we had at least one exercise that was two weeks or three weeks long type thing. Uh, I'm not sure the exact number of exercises. There was a bunch that we did uh, where we did stuff all over Canada, all the way from Hinton where we did a patrolling exercise to Gagetown where we were doing uh, light, not uh, nighttime live uh, company attacks with tanks and labs in support and things like that, which was super awesome super cool um you know you're you're storming this hill with uh, a full company worth of dudes with tanks uh, being your lead uh, suppressing fire so your section runs it behind the tank and you follow it up the hill as you come up to buildings you know the tank would be shooting the building with its coaxial machine gun or its main cannon and then you would run in and clear the room all with live ammunition night vision goggles lasers on your rifle like it was super cool. It was tons of fun. Uh, so for me, I was in uh, seven platoon Charlie company and I was in uh, two section and I was in the Charlie fire team. So uh, basically I was just a rifleman. Uh, I did the TCCC course while on workup. So I was a lead first aider for my section. So if somebody was to get injured, I would be the first uh, primary person 
uh, to kind of get called to attend to them and uh, do whatever critical interventions needed to uh, happen. And then, uh, yeah, when we deployed to Afghanistan, uh, again, I was in my section and, uh, again, I stayed in Charlie team for pretty much the, the tour. Uh, there was sometimes because the vehicles, uh, that we had for the tour was the RG 31. We'd initially planned on going over in the G wagon, but while we were on workup training, it came down, uh, the G wagons weren't allowed outside the wire anymore, uh, because there was a couple of total vehicle kills on previous, uh, tours. Sorry, one sec. Um, and so basically the, at the last second, like literally we were on our checkout exercise in, um, in uh, Wainwright where they told us like, oh, uh, you guys might not be going to Afghanistan because you're not outside the wire with G-Wagons and you're not trained on the labs. So we don't have any vehicles for you. So everyone was kind of freaking out about that. But then they managed to work out that, okay, there's this new vehicle, the RG-31. It's designed to survive IED strikes. Uh, we can get you trained on that and we'll send you over in that. And so because of the size of the vehicle, I was kind of, for a lot of the tour i was separated once we were mounted i was in the headquarters uh vehicle and then i would just relink up with my section once we dismounted but yeah that's kind of how the the tour went in my position in it okay do you feel you're you were prepared for what you were going to face once you got in country and started going on patrols or can training get close but the real world is just a very different beast once you start we felt pretty prepared uh going over like we did a lot of training we did uh like I said, all those exercises, we felt prepared us quite well. Um, you know, a lot of the higher commanders that were watching us doing our live fire attacks and things like that, uh, were saying that we were one of the most well-prepared companies that they'd seen, uh, before deploying. And so going over, we were pretty confident. We thought that we would be getting into a lot more of, uh, kind of gun battle type situations, um, kind of like Op Medusa, which was, I believe the tour or the two tours ahead of us, um, like the, the end of two ahead and the beginning of one ahead of us. And, uh, that kind of just turned out not being the case, uh, for our company. And specifically, uh, we, my platoon at the start of our tour, we were detached from Charlie company to India company. And so we were in a different part of the Panjway, uh, the Argandab Valley uh, area than where the rest of Charlie Company was for about the first month or two, I think it was. And uh, during that time, there really wasn't a whole lot going on. It was still kind of the tail end of winter. And then the summer season is when uh, the fighting typically would kick off in, in Afghanistan at the time. But the Taliban, because they lost so many guys during Op Medusa and things like that, they were still kind of reconstituting their forces and figuring out how they would basically deal with us or what tactics they would use against us, which turned out to be uh, IEDs. So we were kind of right at that start where the ID became a very common uh, tactic for them. And it wasn't like we trained for it. We trained for uh, IEDs and counter ID um, tactics and stuff. We, we weren't expecting it to be as uh, prevalent as it ended up being. And that's, uh, that is what ended up causing the casualties that happened in our company during that tour. However, hotel and India company, they, uh, they ended up getting into some, uh, some gun battles. I'm not sure the exact details of them, but I think my platoon was only ever involved in one, uh, we called it a tick, a troops in contact. And it only lasted all of five or 10 seconds from what I've been told. I wasn't actually present for that one. I was in a, vehicle in a leaguer um for that operation we just kind of separated out a bit where we kept some people in vehicles and some were dismounted and then that just happened really quickly and uh yeah i wasn't even present for it so i was never personally even involved in any real firefights i mean we'd be on patrol and we'd have a little pot shot thrown away our way and it'd be like twang and we're like oh sir sure, i think we just got shot at from the west okay keep an eye on it let's keep patrolling <laughs> And, you know, we never really got into a situation where we're taking effective fire and we had to die for cover, or return fire even really. Uh, not that I can remember, at least. So. OK, what were some eye opening events coming from Canada with so many benefits that most take for granted? And now here you are in Afghanistan seeing how they are living. Yeah, um, it was definitely a fair bit of culture shock. Um you know, uh, 
just just seeing what true true poverty really is right like they they literally have nothing in some respects right like there'd be people there that are literally dirt dirt poor they have the clothes on their backs and not a whole lot else um and yeah it was just uh it's definitely a another world really and just kind of how their society is structured it's very different from ours and uh how they you know even value human life and things like that sometimes uh it seems like they don't um and yeah it was just uh it was definitely interesting and definitely very uh, eye-opening as a 19 year old uh, going there and seeing that part of the world and what the norms were there and what was acceptable, what wasn't acceptable and that sort of thing. When you came back, did that kind of change how you maybe treated or appreciated things? Seeing now you saw them, now you get to come back to the things that you had before. Was there anything you're like, this I cherish so much? What was maybe an item or something that you just like, wow, I get to do this again? Yeah, they're definitely uh, coming back. There certainly was um, a fair bit of like, wow, this is, it's pretty jarring uh, coming back because you're going from uh, being over there patrolling or whatever, and then suddenly within like a week, you're back in Canada, right? And it's just like, wow, like I can, I can just go and go to a restaurant, grab a beer, and every, life is just going on as per normal back home, right? Like people nobody's really paying attention to the news, you know, nobody's, you know, really tracking what's going on overseas or anything like that. And that was such a big part of your life and uh, such an important thing that was going on to you. But back home, you know, it's kind of like, you know, people in general just weren't even tracking that it was even a thing, right? Sometimes. Mm -hmm. So that was a little bit, uh, a little bit jarring, but uh yeah, just being able to go home, hang out with your friends. Uh, you know, you're not bringing all your kit with you. You're not having to worry about checking out vehicles that are driving by you or looking at people's hands all the time as they approach you and that sort of thing. Um, you know, just kind of getting yourself to kind of ramp down how hyper vigilant you were and that sort of thing and just kind of being able to relax again. Uh, it took a little bit of time just to figure that out, but you know, over time, it just, it kind of falls back into place. How long did you find it took for you to get a little bit of that decompression and start to relax? And was there something that you maybe found that helped you just kind of get back to Canadian society? Um, yeah, I think it was just, it didn't take too long, it, you know, a couple of weeks and you're kind of settling back in, but, uh, you know, just spending time with your friends and family um, was kind of the biggest thing. And, uh, yeah, just trying to relax, take some time off uh, and think about, okay, what's next? What's now? Like, where am I going? What am I going to do? You know, and, uh, you know, when I got back, it was good. My regiment was like, hey, like, you know, take out however long you want. Like, you don't need to come in. Like, we're not worried if you don't show up the minimum amount you're supposed to show up like go chill do whatever you want to do and uh i actually ended up going to europe with two friends of mine and just doing a backpacking trip through europe and had a fantastic time doing that and that i think that really helped uh just get everything kind of back to normal i think yeah 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 and that's important stuff like that where you can find something to just have a little fun with and you know like you said, with your tour, there were some hot shots and other guys who had very traumatic, horrible tours and events that they mm -hmm. had. And everyone's going to have that different kind of decompression time. But yeah. it is very important to keep reaching out to friends and the family and not isolate because mm -hmm. there are people that understand exactly what you're going through. Most of them went there with you. You just have to be able to get that vulnerability to be like, hey, you know what, that that one event that March, man, I might have hit me a little bit more than I'm thinking. And nobody's going to judge you or whatever. They're going to be like, all right, man, let's talk about it. Let's get this stuff through. And I think that's been a very important thing from this generation of veterans from other ones. They, they didn't quite share as much. They didn't let, yeah, you know what? Seeing that happen really affected me. It's not, oh, you know what? We fought the Jerry's, we won. And not kind of accepting the things of like, well, no, you can kind of talk it out with everyone else and 
you know, let it happen and stuff. And I, I really enjoy seeing a lot of veterans now finding where there are deficiencies within the systems and starting their own thing and going, all right, you know what, you know, whether it's Canada, America, whatever, this country's not, you know, meeting this need, I'm going to start something else and I'm going to run with it. And I think that's been a great thing too, for guys to find their purpose of continuing to serve and, uh, you know, making, uh, changes. Oh yeah. Things have definitely, uh, progressed, uh, a heck of a lot since, uh, even Afghanistan, uh, at the time for us, uh, like we, you know, we had to go and do during our uh, decompression in uh, Cyprus, you know, they had little classes and stuff like that, but you know, at that time it's still so fresh and Mm -hmm. whatnot, you know, I think, and they were still figuring things out at that point. I think by the end of, uh, 2014 or whatever it was, they had things a lot better by then. Uh, but yeah, definitely, it really uh, is best if you get together with uh, guys who have shared experiences and and are able to talk about that with uh, you know guys who know what you're talking about, right? Because mm-hmm. yeah, just going and seeing a civilian uh, mental health professional or something like that who has no idea what you're talking about, you know, it might help. But uh, from what I've heard and from what I've experienced and talked to other guys, like being able to talk to guys who really understand what you're saying and have like had like experiences is invaluable. Right. Mm -hmm. What were some of the, like the moments that you still remember from your tour, like whether they're great or bad, what are some of the ones that you still look back and go, you know what? That was my tour experience. Um, yeah. Uh, I don't know. Just, uh, you know, just thinking back on patrolling in like 50 degrees Celsius heat, how much sweat you put out, drinking 10 liters of water per day per guy, uh, the amount of weight we would carry, um, you know, and then, uh, yeah, obviously we had two incidents when uh, we lost guys from our company. Um, Yeah, it was June 20th and then uh, July 4th there. Uh, The first one we lost uh, three guys, Sergeant Karajanis, Corporal Bozane, and Private Weeb. And then the second one we lost Mouse Corporal Basin from uh, the West Seas there and uh, Captain Daw, Captain Francis, Corporals Anderson, and uh, Birch, and then Private Watkins. Um, Yeah, uh, those... Definitely were kind of the, those two incidents were definitely the defining moments there when, uh, you know, even though I wasn't personally present at uh, either of the blasts, you know, I responded to the first one and uh, helped secure the area as they were exploiting the site and that sort of thing. And then for the second one, you know, I was about 20 kilometers away at one of the checkpoints and like we heard it in the distance and like we could, you know, it was such a big blast. We could, you know, it almost felt like we could feel like the concussion as it traveled, like all over the valley like that. Right. And we all just kind of stopped and looked at each other and was like, I think we just lost some more guys. And then hearing everything come over the radio, right. Was yeah. Definitely kind of the, uh, the final moments of the tour was those two incidences. And unfortunately for a platoon, it happened both of them to their platoon. So they lost a pretty much an entire section worth of guys and, uh, and their platoon commander as well. So that was pretty rough on, on everybody and doing the ramp ceremony and calf and all that kind of stuff, uh, really hit things home. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And it's, and do you attribute that just to being, they were starting to change their tactics and it was just kind of in that little bit where, Nobody had quite figured out that they were going to start using IEDs in that way and like the size of them. No, I, I would chalk it up to that's just how insidious kind of uh, IEDs and landmines are, right? Um, you know, uh, for the first three guys, uh, Chris Kerr, Janice, and Stephen Bozane and Joel Weeb, uh, they, they were on a route that we'd traveled many times. It was between checkpoints 10 and 5. They're about a kilometer apart. We were securing an area along the main route uh, through the Panjway Valley there in the Argandab River. And, you know, I'm not even sure to this day exactly 
how the Taliban managed to get a, uh, a landmine or an IED on that route. I mean, it was definitely in a spot where we couldn't see from either of the, the checkpoints. But uh, yeah, they, they must have figured out what we were using and where we were driving along. And it was one of those ones where, you know, just a couple feet to the right of where you've normally been traveling or left or whatever it was and they managed to trip it and that's what uh killed the three of them and then for the other vehicle uh you know the rg was supposed to be able to uh, defeat ieds with a v-shaped hull type thing that was reinforced for sustaining blasts like that and from what i'm told uh it basically flattened the hull and completely just destroyed the vehicle um you know, like, so it doesn't matter what vehicle you have. If you just keep building a bomb big enough, eventually, you know, they'll figure it out. Right. Yeah. So, that's... Yeah. I mean, <laughs> and, uh, they, and I, from what I've been, if I'm, I think from like, they weren't even the lead vehicle. Like they basically waited until the one with all the antennas on it, which was the command vehicle was over top the ID. So it must've been, um, command detonated with a wire, I believe. So they had somebody nearby watching and, and detonated it. So, yeah. Jeez. So after your tour, uh, what did you go to school? What was it that you uh, continued to do afterwards before you went Air Force? Yeah, so after my tour, basically, yeah, I got home. I uh, went on that trip to Europe with a couple of friends. And then, uh, you know, I wasn't too sure what to do. In high school, I really enjoyed... Uh, metalwork and welding that sort of thing so i went and i got my welding level c certific certification from bcit and i started working at a local uh, uh shipyard in vancouver um on mitchell island and that place was ridiculous uh the safety things that were going on there were just mind-blowingly stupid and uh i wasn't too uh impressed uh with you know seeing guys taking a compressed air cylinder that's like five feet tall tons of air inside of it and just laying it across the forks of a forklift angling the forks up and then ripping down the middle of the uh, shipyard with it and then slamming on the brakes and it rolls to the very end of the forks and then rolls back and they don't even have the metal cap on the top of the valve like just put a c clamp in front of it tie it down like any of that, like mm. that stuff was just normal at this yard and i was just blown away and eventually uh you know uh i think i decided to leave that job and also the 2008 financial crisis hit at the same time so work was drying up and uh everything was just kind of uh had just all the jobs were just gone right so basically around that time, the Vancouver 2010 Olympics were going to be starting to kick off. Mm -hmm. And for that was Operation Podium. And in the summer of 2009, I finished my PLQ training. And so I was like, oh, like this is like a solid um, six or eight month long class B contract to work for the Olympics and do Olympic security. So I jumped onto that, got back into doing full time uh, with the army locally in Vancouver there, which is really cool and did the Vancouver Olympics on Cypress Mountain. I was a section 2IC at that point, which was really cool. I got to patrol all over Cypress Mountain with my dad of four guys. It was just me and the three of them. And then my sergeant had another three guys, but we kind of set it off into four man teams. And that's just kind of how we patrolled for the Olympics. And there was really, there was no threat or anything like that. That was just, you know, we're walking around Cyprus securing it. And it's like, who's coming up here? Literally like nobody, right? And, uh, you know, and we had RCMP embedded with us so that if we actually did run into somebody, they would be the ones dealing with them anyways. So, yeah, we did our little piece and just assisted with that. And then after that, I wasn't too sure, you know, what to do next. And then uh, the Rural Canadian Legion had set up uh, this program called the uh, the Rural Canadian Legion uh, Skills Conversion Program out of BCIT where basically you would get credit for your uh, military service, the courses and things that you've done would equate into post-secondary credits. And so a few guys had done that the previous year and they said that it was a really good program. It was uh, going into a business program. The, you would start with a diploma in uh, business management. So it was a post-diploma program. So a two-year program condensed into one where you would do uh, eight courses per semester. So 
instead of four courses as a full load, you're doing eight. And so it literally was a Monday to Friday, like nine to five full-time job. And so I opted to do that. And then uh, coming towards the end of my one year of doing that, uh, I s attended a presentation where uh, they talked about uh, you could do the Bachelor of Business Administration program and you could do the first year of that as an exchange student at uh, an affiliate school in Europe or a few other choices. And I ended up going straight from that presentation to the uh, like literally I walked out the door and then walked to the foreign, ex the exchange student uh, office and was like, Hey, I want to go. And they were just like, uh, okay, like, do you want to go for one semester or two? And I was like, Oh, I can do a full year. Yeah, I'll do a full year. And they're just like, okay. Mm -hmm. And, uh, immediately on the spot, just signed up right there and settled on going nice. to uh, Berlin, Germany for a year. And so I went to, uh, Berlin to, uh, HGW Berlin, which is, a uh, a polytechnic kind of school in uh, downtown uh, Berlin. And uh, that's what I did the next year for the first year of my BBA. I had a fantastic time uh, living in Germany, studying there. And then uh, once that was over, I came back home and uh, finished off my degree and just kind of kept working uh, with the Westies and that sort of thing. Cool. And then so from that, what was the deciding factor to now go Air Force? So I'd always been interested in flying in the Air Force, um, you know, at some point, uh, I'm not sure exactly when, it was probably around about when I was going to BCIT for the degree, um, you know, I inquired to the the recruiting center in Vancouver, I was like, oh, like, what would I need to do in order to uh, to qualify to uh, to get in as a pilot? And they basically told me like, oh, you're gonna have to go back and redo some high school math courses. You're gonna have to upgrade with the university level math courses. And I was just like, I'm not, I'm not doing that. Like my math in high school was terrible. And you know, I, th I think I got 56% or something in grade 11 math or something like that. Like it was not my, my natural strong suit. And so I just kind of wrote that off. But then at some point, um, me and a bunch of friends were hanging out in the, uh, the quartermaster stores. And we were talking about, oh, what would you do if you were to go reg for us? Like, what would get you to actually make the jump from the reserves to the regs? And, you know, the only thing I could think of was going pilot. Um, just because, you know, at that point, I felt like I'd seen kind of what the reg force infantry was like. And, you know, I just, it didn't entice me that much to go do it um, with the reg force. But, uh you know, going to do something new like pilot and, you know, that just seemed like a lot better uh, long-term plan at that point in my life. And a friend of mine who had actually transferred to the Navy, he was like, oh, why don't you just go on the component transfer website and just select pilot and hit send and see what happens. I was like, what do you mean? And he's like, yeah, it's just a website, man. Like, here, I'll show you. And he took me to the website and literally just a drop down menu, select down, like, oh, there's pilot, clicked it, put in all my info and hit send. And then, uh, and that was that, uh, you know, a couple months later I got an email, uh, and basically in the email from what I remember, it was telling me like, Oh, submit your commercial pilot's license and logbook and all this information. And so I kind of took that as if I didn't have that and that experience and they weren't considering the component transfer. So I just never really responded to the email. And so every six months for like a year, year and a half, that email would come out and I would just kind of always ignore it because I'm like, well, that doesn't apply to me. And then finally this master warrant officer emailed me directly going, Hey, are you still interested in this? And I was like, yeah, of course I am. He's like, ah, why didn't you respond? And I told him why. And he's like, Oh, okay. Yeah. I guess we did word that kind of poorly. <laughs> he's like, you should have just replied and like, cause you don't need that. And I was like, Oh, well, I wish I'd done that because then I would have been in this process a lot sooner. But anyways, it took a while. And uh, and yeah, so they sent me to Trenton uh, right off the bat just to do the selection testing, um, which was over two days. Uh, I think it was 32 or 38 different exams on the computer. Um, and pretty much for the study package for it, it, in almost all of the tests, it tells you there's no way to study for this test. There's no way to study for this test. Like it gives you a brief little like, description of it. And it's just, you know, it's testing your kind of hand-eye coordination or your multitasking or your logical reasoning things like that. It's just this wide battery of, uh, tests. 
And so they send you for two days and, you know, you do half the tests on one day and then half the tests the next. And then at the end, they tell you your scores on all of them. And if you pass for pilot or at the same time, they're testing you for air combat systems officer or uh, the air traffic control trade as well. And, you know, if you qualified for one of the trades, but not the others, then they'll tell you that at that point. But uh, yeah, out of the 20 people that were there, I think there was three of us who actually qualified for pilot but one of the guys got ruled out because his femurs were too long his body anthropomorphics didn't fit for the cockpits and so they were just like oh sorry you can do the other two and he was like oh, oh right but oh, that's i know suck. just so close but like guess what uh, and there's nothing You're you can do about it and there's nothing you can do about it unless yeah. you want to shorten your legs and be like mm-hmm. Like, oh, yeah so yeah. close but never gonna happen and, and like you can be tall too it's just i i think it just comes down to like the length of your femur or something like that because if you have to eject out of the say the harvard or the f-18 or something like that um you know from what i've been told i don't know if this is true like it might you know you might hit your legs on the way out and suffer a lot of injuries so they won't they won't allow you to go in the plane right but for me like the guy doing the testing you know, I stood there in front of him and he looked me up and down and we were literally the exact same height, the exact same size. He's like, yeah, you'll be fine. I'm like, okay, cool. <laughs> so that worked oh. out. And, uh, and yeah, so basically I finished that, but then, uh, the medical and all that kind of stuff, just getting that done with a flight surgeon in Vancouver, like that took a year. So, you know, it was like a year, year and a half of, you know, putting in the component transfer, a year to get the medical done. And then finally in March of 20, 2019, uh, my component transfer went through and, uh, and then suddenly, you know, literally like one day I'm a reservist at my reserve unit, uh, Sergeant just, you know, chilling. And then they're like, okay, yep. You're reg force now. And I'm like, okay, like, where am I going? Like, who owns me? Like, what do I do? And my adjutant at the time's like, Oh, they haven't told you. I'm like, no, they haven't told me anything. I don't know where to go or who's expecting me. And he's like, Oh, let me email Edmonton he emails Edmonton. And he comes back to me and he's like, Oh, they asked me if I wanted you. So I said, yes, you can just parade out of here until your course comes up. I'm like, Oh, okay, cool. Cause like I lived in new West, like five minutes from the regiment at the time. So it was really easy. I just showed up there every day. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so now that you've got your uh, your component transfer, what is the pipeline for becoming a pilot? Yeah, so you're going to – I think typically what they're going to do is they're going to send you on phase one uh, first. Uh, or correction, you'll go on your aeromedical training first. So you'll go to uh, Winnipeg where, you know, they're going to teach you about the different um, things that can disorient you as a pilot in the cockpit, you know, um, and different uh, kind of visual uh, things that might happen that, you know, might disorient you and get your spatial uh, reasoning all kind of messed up, right? And then you'll also do uh, kind of hypoxia training where you learn what it feels like to become hypoxic. So they'll put an oxygen mask on you, you're in a compression chamber, and they'll slowly dial down the amount of oxygen coming into your mask, and you'll see how your body kind of reacts, how your mind uh, deals with it and they'll have like this sheet where you're kind of filling it out and trying to answer all these questions on it. And you'll see like, you know, once you're done and they turn the auction back on, you'll look in your, your writing just goes out the window. You're putting stuff down that doesn't really make sense. And, uh, you know, what they want to see is like, once you realize the effects, then you have a lever that you turn your auction back to normal and then everything kind of returns to normal for the most part. Um, so that training was really a lot of fun and they'll they'll sit you in a chair as well and spin you in circles to kind of disorient you and then they'll stop it and then you kind of see how long it takes for you to your equilibrium to get back in check and things like that so that that training was was a lot of fun and then uh yeah from there you'll do phase one flight training out of portage la prairie where you go fly the uh the grobe and that takes about three to four months depending on weather and uh, what time of year it is and things like that. It can go quite quickly or it can go quite slowly. Um, there's strict uh, conditions in which they'll let you go fly type thing, right? So if the weather's not good enough for coming back and being able to see the runway and do visual approaches, you know, you're not gonna, you're not gonna go fly. 
And then uh, once phase one is done, you're going to do your land survival, sea survival training, uh, where basically you go off uh, for land survival. It's done in uh, Nopamine Provincial or National Park. I'm not sure what, which one it is. Uh, but it's basically northeast of Winnipeg in the middle of uh, kind of nowhere. And you're going to go there for, I think it's about two weeks long. And they'll teach you how to make a fire, um, how to kind of hunt for food, forage for food a bit, how to make a shelter. And then it all ends where you basically have three nights, four days by yourself in the bush um, with nobody around. And basically you have all these survival tasks that you have to complete over those days. And then on the uh, fourth day, they'll come out and basically assess what you've done, how effective it's been. And, uh, you know, give you a passing grade on that uh, if you've done everything to the appropriate standard. And I found that just a ton of fun, right? Coming from the infantry, like I was comfortable in the forest and uh, being on your own is a kind of a new thing because in the army, like you're never really on your own, but uh, getting to do that by yourself was really neat. Um, I didn't catch anything, didn't get any food, but uh, I always kept myself pretty warm and uh, yeah, I had a great time. You're chopping down trees and building fires in a shelter for yourself and you make this big uh, fire um, signal device that uh, you know at the end you get a set off you spend all these hours upon hours making this smoke signal device and then finally you get to light it and see how it works and yeah that was that was really cool and at some point they had a hercules aircraft fly out and whoever had the best um, passive kind of signal to bring the herc into their position um basically they would they dropped a little care package so it was just like a can of pop and a chocolate bar because you're not allowed to you're not given any food for these days right <laughs> you have some survival gummies that you know don't really do anything <laughs> just you calories know, there's, yeah there's a couple little calories but uh, you kind of eat those sparingly but it's not going to fill you up it's not going to make you feel full or anything like that but uh, it gives you a little boost of energy but uh, yeah it was a ton of fun and I really enjoyed that. And then Sea Survival was out of Comox. And that's where basically you get to learn um, how to activate the life rafts if you're in an aircraft that has to ditch in the ocean. Or you're, uh, or if you're uh, in a single, so like, say you're in the F-18 or something and you eject and how to land in the water under a parachute and then what to do if you're getting dragged and then you're in a single uh, life raft by yourself. So there's kind of two portions to the course, one where you're in the larger life raft with a crew of people and then another where you're kind of solo on your own. Uh, and yeah, that was, again, a ton of fun. It was Comox. I think we were doing it in February, so it was nice and cold. Um, but, you know, they have you in a wetsuit, so you're, like, you're not going to get hypothermic, really. Um, but I think on day one, uh yeah you you go for a swim and it's it's fun to jump in the water and uh get that cold water shock it's it's pretty neat did you find people had problem with the survival bit like you having background infantry you're not going to care about laying on the ground whatever did you find some people were very like apprehensive about being in nature or being in the water yeah, some people, it was pretty new to them. Um, like for me in cold water, I, I like to scuba dive. That's one of my main hobbies. Uh, so I was pretty used to the cold water of uh, the Vancouver coast. But for a lot of people, uh, they were probably experiencing that for the first time in their lives. But, you know, that's why they do those uh, that inoculation training where you get to experience it and then kind of get used to it. And, you know, everyone's very motivated. Everyone's pretty fit. Um, so eventually everybody pretty much figures it out. It's pretty rare that you have somebody who, uh, isn't able to, uh, to kind of figure it out. And the staff are great. Like they'll, they'll train you, they'll teach you what you need to know and how to do it. And you know, they'll, they'll get you through it. Perfect. Well, uh, I mean, you'll get yourself through it, but they'll, <laughs> they'll give you the tools needed. Right. So it's yeah. up to you, but yeah. So now you've done your survival courses. You're having fun with that. So that is that phase two, you said? How many no, so, oh, sorry, sorry. so yeah, yeah. How many so phases me, are there in total kind of things that, to get like full on your qualified your wings. on a plane? Yeah. Yeah. So there's three flight phases okay. uh, for the multi-engine and the rotary uh, streams for if you're going to go fast jet. So the F-18s. Um, Typically what's going to have, like they'll have a few more courses in there basically before you're going to be fully qualified on 
your uh, on your on the F eighteen or something like that, right? Uh, but I know a little bit more about the multi engine and the rotary streams. So basically, the way it works for those two is you have phase one flight training, and that's the universal for everybody. Mm-hmm. Uh, phase two now has kind of changed a little bit recently where there's phase two rotary, there's phase two Grobe, there's phase two Harvard. So there's kind of three different options for that at this point in time, uh, which again, it's changing soon. They're coming up with a whole new, uh, progression, uh, training process. Uh, they're going to get a new phase two aircraft. Um, as far as I know, nothing, nothing's really, uh, it's probably set in stone, but I don't know exactly uh, what it is, right? But for when I was going through, uh, yeah, you basically had phase two. And then uh, depending, phase two is kind of where they just determine what stream you're going to go into, right? So at the end of phase two, you have your selection board and they select, okay, you're going to go to multi-engine, which is all of our fixed wing aircraft. You're going to go to rotary, which is all of our helicopters, obviously. And, or you could go uh, phase three Harvard, which could lead you into either the F-18s or you could go into the, the QFI route where you're now going to be a qualified flying instructor pretty much right out the gate as your first tour where you're going to key where you're going to teach the next generation of pilots as well right once you're done phase three that's where you're considered um you've reached your ofp point your operational functional point or yeah and uh you get your wings right so but still then even after phase three you're not qualified on the final aircraft that you're going to be employed on right so after phase three you have your operational training unit where you're going to go learn the specific airframe that you're going to be employed on right but now you're going to it as a captain you're going to it as a wing pilot um you know it's it's expected you're going to pass your fit your otu right you should have all the tools that you need in order to do that and uh and be successful going forward in your career so phase one two and three are kind of the courses where they determine if you're going to be successful in the long run, right? And then once you do your OTU, you're now uh, finished that, you'll be a first officer uh, on your aircraft and you'll basically do the required amount of training or flights and get the experience you need. And later you'll upgrade to aircraft uh, captain or aircraft commander and basically carry on with your career that way. And there's all sorts of different courses and you know, each airframe has its own kind of things going on. Now, when they start dividing you between rotary fix, stuff like that, what are some of the criteria that they look at for each kind of pilot? Um, you know, I, I've never, obviously I've just got through the training process myself, so I've never been a part of a selection board or anything like that, but basically the, you know, they'll look at your grades on all your different, like clear hood, instrument flight, uh, navigation and, um, formation flying on phase two. Uh, the instructors will have input, uh, you know, cause they've gone through the process. They've gone to an operational squadron and they'll have input on what they think you would be a good pilot for. And so there's lots of things that go into it. Uh, your, your own officer kind of development, how, how you project yourself as an officer and, you know, how, um, how professional you are also plays into it. Right. So they'll take all of that into consideration. So it's not just your flying and your grades that they look at. Um, and they'll look at everything all together and decide kind of what would be the best fit for you and also what the air force needs at that time. Right. Mm -hmm. So it could be, you know, some selections where there's just, there's no jet spots and there's no multi spots. Everyone's going helicopter because that's what the air force needs at that point in time. And whether you wanted something else, well, it is what it is kind of thing. You know, but they they're getting they've gotten really good these days where they try to take into account what you're interested in and what's going to keep you happy and and keep you motivated. Right. Because Mm -hmm. if you come into it like dead set, I want to do this, but you don't get the grades. That's one thing. Or if you're dead set on something, if they can give it to you so that you're going to, you know, continue to work really hard at it and be really motivated for it. You know, it's best for everybody in that case. Right. So. Um, yeah, it depends on a lot of things from, from what I know. How much prep time is needed to get everything completed to actually go flying? And does the flight time change how much prep is needed before you can fly? 
Uh, the actual flight time of the flight, I would say, doesn't have too much to do with it. Um, it's really more what are the, the weather conditions for the day, um, what you're going to be practicing during that flight. Um, so different flights uh, will require a little bit different of prep time. Um, you know, especially if, if the weather is a little bit more complicated, then you definitely need to take a little bit more time to prep and make sure that you've assessed everything. And if your instructor has a question for you, you need to be prepared to answer it mm -hmm. and know what you're talking about and kind of get it right. And, you know, sometimes you got to fumble your way through a bit and, you know, it'll be a learning experience if you miss something, right? But, uh, you know, before a flight in the morning on, say, phase two, like if your wheels up time is like 8 a.m., you'll be there at like 6 a.m. getting ready for that flight, um, taking a look at what the, the weather is, the METARs and the TAFs, and then making sure that you've uh, prepped your, you know, you have a board that you'll prep up that'll kind of explain uh, what the flight is and what you're expecting. And you'll have different products that you'll have on uh on the computer and stuff for you and your instructor to go over and, you know, you'll brief the flight to them and then you'll kind of switch seats. And then the instructor will brief uh, what they want you to focus on, what happened on your last flight, how you can improve this time, what they're going to want to see out of you this time and that sort of thing. And, you know, the whole briefing, it can take anywhere from 10, 15 minutes of, yep, the weather's good. We're going to go do this so that we've done before. And this is just another practice. Or if it's something really new where you're introducing a lot of new material, it really changes kind of how long these briefings uh, take. And then just getting to the plane, uh, getting strapped in, getting started up, you know, like that all takes a fair bit of time. Uh, yeah. So it really, really kind of depends what you're doing and uh, it'll be different kind of, uh, each new phase that you kind of get into, right? Like if you're doing the the navigation phase, like you have to, you know, look at the weather, decide which route you're going to go on. Are you going north? Are you going south? And then you have to prep your map. You have to put all the current winds and draw that in onto your map. You have to make a copy for your instructor. And like, it's, it's very involved. And then for me, like there was a lot of forest fire smoke while I was doing my nav phase. And so there'd be a lot of days where I would prep the flight we would brief the flight and then we wouldn't fly because the weather, you know, you, you couldn't see, like it just wasn't yeah. feasible. Right. But you still go through that whole process. You have to do all your maps and then throw them in the trash. <laughs> and then, you know, later on that day, it might be like, Hey, we're going to brief in, you know, half an hour, like get ready because we think we might be able to go. And then you have to redo it all over again. And yeah, so it, it's a lot of work, but uh, it was, it was a lot of fun. So flight plans and all the logistics that has to be sorted, what does it take to legally fly a plane on any given day? Now, maybe civilian and military, there might be a, a few differences, but like what, how much, like, it seems like there is quite a bit of work before you even get to enjoy taking off. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, the first time you take off, you're going, you're going to enjoy it, but uh, you're going to be very focused on like, oh my, like, you know, it's, it's a lot of new stuff going on at once. Right. So before you know it, it's, it's kind of over. And, you know, once you get the, once you get the plane cleaned up and you're flying straight and level, that's when kind of you, you're first able to kind of relax and take a look around. Right. Especially on your uh, phase one kind of training, right. You're just, you're just trying to get used to all the new stuff and sensations, but the simul you do a lot of simulator training before you ever actually get in the real plane. Right. And the Sims are actually quite good. Um, they're, they're pretty close to the real thing. They're not exactly like it, but uh, they're they're good enough, right? Um, but uh, sorry, what was the first part of your question again? Just to oh, uh, let me go back to uh, like just kind of like uh, flight plans and logistics, like yeah, how yeah, much stuff actually has to try and like what actually has to get done before you can even take off? Yeah, so there's there's um. Some days it's super easy. Like you literally look out the window, it's a bright blue sunny day and you're like, yeah, we're going flying, right? Like uh, depending on what the mission is, like it's, if you're staying in the local area, going to the local training area, you know, if there's no weather conditions, like you just, you know, you're going flying and everything's good. But if you're driving in and you're looking at the weather and the ceilings look pretty low and you're supposed to be doing a clear hood mission where you're going to go do aerobatics and things like that. You know, some days driving in, you can be like, there is no way we're going flying today. Like it's just not going to happen. Um, 
And then sometimes you have those days and you get there and you actually look at what the weather charts and products are saying. You're like, oh, we are actually going to go today. Um, but, uh, but yeah, you re- it really comes down to as a student, you have certain weather conditions that you're allowed to fly in for certain missions and others that you're not allowed to fly into. And so it's just knowing those and applying them every day to whatever it is going on outside. And then once you're actually in an operational squadron, um, depending on your airframe, you know, especially for multi-engine, um, you know, we can fly in almost, depending on your plane, you can fly in almost any weather really, uh, like, uh, the plane can, can do it. It's just so long as when you get to your destination, if you have the appropriate weather conditions for that airport, the type of approaches you can do, if there's an alternate nearby, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of legalities, uh, that go, the rules that go into it on what's legal to take off in and land in. And you can basically discern that all just by assessing the weather and knowing what the different, uh, rules are. And sometimes it's super easy where you're just like, yeah, we're, definitely going or others it's like oh i'm really gonna have to search for an alternate i'm gonna have to look at how much weight is in the aircraft how much fuel are we gonna be able to carry uh how far away is this alternate how long is it going to take to get there what the winds are uh you know and then oh we can only take this amount of fuel okay what alternates are in range and then you have to be able to get to the alternate hold for 45 minutes then shoot an approach and all these fuel calculations and things are kind of going into it so it's when you're getting into instrument flight, it, it really gets quite uh, quite involved. Whereas if, if you're flying VFR uh, the whole way, so visual flight rules, it's it's a lot more straightforward. It's do we have enough fuel to get there? And if it's VFR the whole way, then then you're good, right? You just go and you just do a visual approach and land. But if you're going IF and you're going to be doing, you know, an ILS or a different type of approach and landing and the weather's like on the edge, you know, there's certain thresholds where, you know, if the weather's this, then you require, you know, an alternate or, you know, if there's two ILSs at the airport, that changes things. And if there's only one ILS then that adjusts the limits and like, it really gets quite involved into instrument flying. That's crazy. I mean, that sounds so it's it's a little mind boggling. Like, yeah, for, for, especially when you're in training, like you have these, you know, these sheets where it kind of lays it all out and you kind of go through it and, you know, yeah, we got this. Yeah, we got this. Oh, we don't have this. Oh, we can't, you know, because of this, we cannot go or we, sh- we shouldn't go or you bring it up to your instructor. Like, Hey, I don't really recommend that we go and here's why. And, you know, they're the one who's the aircraft commander or the aircraft captain. So they're the one who makes the final choice on if we're actually going to go on the mission or not. Right. But they want to see you as a first officer and the student coming up with, you know, Hey, I'm aware of everything and I know what the rules are and here's why we can or cannot go or i think we can or cannot go and then sometimes we're like yeah we're definitely there's no way we can go because of this and then they're like oh but if we do this this and this we can and it's legal now so let's go and you're like oh okay neat and so it's 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 a learning curve it really does sound like it so what are the different positions and responsibility of like each of the crew member on the plane that you are going to be qualifying on Kind of during each of the steps of like pre takeoff, flying, landing and after because with the crew and stuff like it sounds like there's a ton of stuff going on. So how do some of those responsibilities get divided between the crew? Yeah, so I'm going to be flying on the Twin Otter. Um, I haven't even had a chance really to do a ton of uh, reading on my specific aircraft that I'm going to be going on to just now. But for us, there's a minimum crew of three members. So you're going to have the aircraft captain and then the first officer, and then you're gonna have a flight engineer as well in the back. Um, The flight engineer, as I understand it, is, you know, they have a lot of different responsibilities. It's actually their aircraft, we're just flying it, right? And they're responsible for anything to do with like weight and balance, uh, securing the load, making sure the aircraft is ready and serviceable to fly. And they do a lot of, uh, you know, assessing the aircraft and making sure like, everything is what we need it to be in order for us to go fly that day. And, um, you know, as a first officer, your job is basically, um, you know, you'll, you'll assist, uh, the aircraft captain in all the flight planning and prep. 
uh you know you'll you'll book hotels if you need to or you'll you'll kind of organize like okay we're going here for x number of days and you'll kind of look at and figure everything out that's required for your crew over that time and the aircraft captain is as, as i understand it is more focused on the mission and what needs to exactly happen and all that sort of stuff they'll make the final decision on any weather and uh what the mission requires and you know are we going to go aren't we going to go why why not and basically uh, briefing the crew on what's happening and and all that kind of stuff and uh, you know at all flees as a flight we each have our own individual uh rules and or jobs and responsibilities and it also really comes down to not even just who's the ac and who's the fo but who's in the left seat and who's in the right seat so depending on what seat you are in a multi-engine aircraft will give you different roles and responsibilities at different phases of flight. And, you know, both the first officer and the aircraft captain can trade off, uh, in either the left or the right seat, depending on what type of, uh, experience they need to stay current or whatever is going on. Right. So typically the right seat, you're not going to be actually flying the aircraft by, uh, flying the aircraft, you're going to be managing the radios, you're going to be doing certain checks and certain parts of checks, you're going to be, uh, you know, monitoring the engines during takeoff and uh, things like that, right? Whereas in the left seat, you're going to be the one actually physically flying the airplane and uh, doing all the actual physical inputs to it. At certain points during the flight, when you're, say, getting for ready for an approach, you'll transfer control to the right seat while you do your prep to get uh, your approach plates up and brief the approach and things like that, then you transfer control back. And so it's this, you know, kind of choreographed, uh, laid, well laid out kind of sequence of events and who does what and when. And, you know, that's kind of what all your training's for. And then you'll get trained specifically on your aircraft and what the different things are required for that plane. Okay. What are the first like actually flying a plane, then solo, bad weather in night? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, the first time you fly uh, on phase one, that was really neat. Um, you know, they don't overload the, that flight too much. A lot of it is just going out and just getting a feel for the plane, uh, experiencing stuff for the first time and just kind of getting your brain kind of accustomed to that new environment. And, uh, you know, take a second, look outside, go, holy sh crap, this is pretty cool. I'm getting paid for this. This is amazing. And then, you know, your head's back in the game. Like, okay, what's my instructor expecting of me? What am I supposed to be, you know, looking for? And just, you know, gain a feel for everything. So the first flight is kind of that. It goes pretty quick. Um, and that's your first time flying ever. Eh? You had no civilian anything at all. No, no actual nope. instructional time. Yeah. Like I, my mom took me to Toronto one time. Uh, she used to work for Canada so we could fly standby really cheap. And she took me to Toronto for this, uh, kind of civilian fighter combat. Uh, you know, they, they had this, uh, company where you go do laser tag basically in the sky between two aerobatics planes. But, uh, at that day there was no second plane. So I just went up with basically a former F-18 pilot and we went and did aerobatics in this small aerobatics plane, which was just a ton of fun. Right. And that, that also kind of helped cement in like, oh, this would be such a cool thing to do for my, for the rest of my life. Right. And, uh, yeah, so that's kind of really, that's kind of my prior flight experience before actually learning how to fly. Um, you know, aside from small, like, oh, we're going on a helicopter to see Whistler or something like that, um, you know, with my friend's dad and something like that, right? So stuff like that was really, really cool. And, you know, I always enjoyed flying on family uh, trips, you know, vacations as a small kid. Like, I thought it was super cool just going and getting an even just commercial airliner and just going somewhere was tons of fun, right? But, uh, yeah, that first time flying yourself was was pretty awesome. <laughs> and then uh first solo uh yeah you do that on phase one uh basically you you just do a couple of circuits in the local traffic pattern for your airport you do a touch and go and then you come down and land so really the flight only takes like i don't know 20 25 minutes not even <laughs> uh it goes pretty quick but then uh for the military once you land it's a tradition where you'll get uh dunked in a bathtub full of water and the might throw some soap in there too. And then your solo patches inside the tub and you have to find it, you know, it's a really cool tradition. Uh, it's not mandatory to do it, but you know, it's, uh, it's one of those cool things, uh, to do that, 
you know, they do it for a lot of different, uh, a lot of different planes. If that's your first time flying the plane solo. Right. And, uh, yeah, just being a part of that tradition is really neat. Uh, when I did it, it was winter time. It was like minus 30 and obviously they let the water uh, get really nice and cold before I got into it. There's a good layer of ice on top of it that they threw you through and then into the water and then find your patch and, you know, get out and somebody will slap it on your shoulder and then go inside and get a warm shower. And then, uh, that's kind of your day for that day. So that was really cool. And it's just similar for the Harvard too. uh, soloing on that plane. Uh, their first trip is just in the, uh, in the circuit pattern there doing some touch and goes, but that time you'll actually stay up for like a full, a full mission, a full hour and, you know, 15 minutes or whatever it is. And you're just ripping the circuit, just doing as many touch and goes as you possibly can, just gain as much experience on the plane, uh, landing as you, as you can. And that was tons, tons of fun. And then uh, your first solo where you get to go and do aerobatics out in the training area by yourself, that's really neat too. Cause then, you know, you're doing loops and rolls and, and uh, figure eight and uh, clovers. And yeah, it was, it was great. Uh, it was so much fun. So you're just in this high performance plane with an ejection seat, oxygen mask, and you're just ripping by yourself <laughs> and just, you know, keeping an eye on, uh, the radio traffic and your TCAS, make sure there's no other planes kind of in your area. You, you, we have the area blocked off. Like, you know, you've signed into like, Oh, I'll be in this training area, but other planes are allowed to enter. Um, and then you just have to, between the two of you deconflict and be like, okay, I'll stay north of this point. You stay south of that. And that'll keep us kind of away from each other type thing. Right. And, uh, so that was really neat. The first night flight I went on was, uh, yeah, it was one of my early instrument flight missions. So typically, uh, night flying, uh, they only do it at certain points throughout the year. Um, it's not, it's not required say on phase two to get night flights in, <clears throat> but, um, you know, if you're doing an instrument flight, uh, flight, uh, basically you can go at night because you don't have to see anything outside the cockpit, right? You're just focused inside on the instruments and stuff. So I actually got to go up and, and do an, a nighttime flight. And that was really neat. Cause again, you take a second look outside the window. Oh, that's really cool. And then back inside and back to work. Right. Uh, but it's, yeah, it's just, it's kind of the same as any IF flight where like you're in clouds and you can't see anything and you're just focused on your flight instruments. And then, uh, for the first bad weather flight, um, yeah, so I think that was actually kind of due to forest fire smoke, um, where we were doing, uh, an approach into Re- Regina international airport and in the missed approach, um, I remember, you know, we leveled off, but because it was all smoky and you had no outside references, you know, even though it was, yeah, it was an IF flight, but, uh, but even then, like, you know, it still kind of felt like you're pitching back, And it it was just like, you know, your instincts to push forward, but you're looking at your instruments and you're straight and level. And so you have to fight that urge. And, you know, that was, that was pretty neat. And so sometimes when you're in clouds or you're in periods of low visibility, like that's one of the things that if you're flying IF, you need to always be aware of and trust your instruments and uh, not just follow what your brain is telling you or your equilibrium is telling you, because it can be very, very wrong. (laughs) That's, that's crazy. Yeah. Now, when you were kind of in that bad weather, was it like a really bad storm or just kind of like not nice, but it wasn't like, oh, we landed. Thank God. Um, yeah, I've definitely been on a f- one or two flights where, you know, like we were we were coming in on an IF mission. Otherwise, we, if it was a uh, clear admission, we wouldn't have even taken off in this weather. Right. But there's definitely a few times where. Uh, the we we were approaching minimums and it's still just you know you're in the cloud right and then you know you're coming up to your decision altitude or decision height and then you know and you do this in the simulator a lot well they'll they'll put the weather right at the minimum and so like 10 feet before you hit your decision altitude like the clouds will part and you'll see the runway and then you can land right but then doing it for the first time in real life uh is pretty, pretty interesting as well, because you're like, Oh, we might actually not come out of the clouds and then we're gonna have to execute a missed approach. And then you have to go basically go around again for another full, another approach. You're gonna have to talk to the, uh, terminal controller and, 
get approved for, you know, another, another approach and you have to come in and try it again, but then you're going to have to start going, okay, like how much fuel do we have? How far away is our alternate? What's the weather at our alternate right now? And then you're going to have to start going through all these mental kind of calculations and you know you have a knee pad you can write uh, notes down and stuff on and then you have to start figuring out like okay what's our plan b if like this doesn't work out and we can't actually land here at our preferred airport like we have to go somewhere else um because the minimums are the minimums for a reason right in order to safely land at the airport you know you can't you can't land if the clouds are pretty much at the ground right it's just not it's just not a thing. It's not safe. There are aircraft who can do it, but it's not certainly not our training aircraft that we're in right now as basic trainers, right? So crazy. Yeah, some of that. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 a lot of fun. <laughs> oh, I can bet. But there's yeah. like you said, we were saying before, like there's a lot of responsibility, and to have that fun, you're making sure a oh, ton yeah. of different things are all green. Otherwise, something's going to go wrong. Yeah. Um, how yeah. many hours do you get normally in like a simulator and actually in the plane during some yes. of these different phases? So it really changes from phase to phase. Um, I can't remember exactly how many hours we got in the sim on phase one. Uh, like it might've only been something like 12 hours or something like that. Um, you know, phase two, there was a fair bit more simulator time because you're doing IF sims and that sort of thing as well. Um, and then phase three, uh, there's a whole block of sims before you ever even get into the plane. And uh, yeah, I can't remember exactly how many simulation hours I've got in my logbook, but total flight hours, I've got about 167 and that's really it, <laughs> um, which isn't a whole lot. Like civilian side, um, you know, to, to be a, to get your commercial pilot's license. I don't even know exactly how many hours it is, but I think it's a fair bit more than that. But for all of our flights, like they really pack a lot of training into every single flight, like every hour, uh, you know, every minute, like time is not wasted. Like you're going from one skill to the next skill, uh, constantly working on everything. And so there's really not a whole lot of like, Oh, just go for a rip and just have some time in the plane. Like every minute is, you know, <clears throat> taking advantage of that time and that training. And so, especially with the instrument flying, um, you know, they introduce that to you really early on and that's just, that's just a part of your flying. Whereas there's a lot of, uh, you know, say private pilot license guys, um, who all they all they do is VFR flying. They've never, you know, you you have re, you have to uh, really focus on getting your instrument rating that sort of thing. But then even when you get an instrument rating, from what I'm told, you know, it doesn't it doesn't uh, qualify you to do everything IF, right? Like we basically like we can do ILSs, we can do RNAV approaches, we can do NDB approaches, VORs, and like you know, if there's a, an approach to be flown pretty much we can we can fly it um for the most part there's a few things that uh, i haven't done yet but uh yeah depending on the airframe you get on uh yeah it's uh you get exposed to pretty much everything interesting now you were talking about the first solo patch what are some of the special achievements pilots can earn with different patches and what are some that you have your eye on before you retire um I don't know if, you know, there's, so the patch is like, I don't really do anything just to try and get a patch, right? But it's nice along the way, like, oh, you've earned your solo patch for this aircraft. That's awesome. Uh, you know, whenever you're on a course, you'll come up with a course patch course patch to commemorate kind of that course with your with your course mates and stuff right and so the air force is fairly heavy on patches <laughs> they do like them and kind of every new airframe you go on to like you'll get a new name tag with that aircraft on it and your name okay. um and then you know as you progress you know you could get you know a qualified flying instructor patch you know, if you hit a thousand hours on an aircraft, a lot of planes will have a patch just for that or different kind of um, milestones and things like that. But there's nothing saying you have to purchase those. Um, you know, your solo patch is kind of one of the ones that really gets awarded to you. A lot of the other ones, if you qualify for it, uh, a lot of the time you might just purchase that yourself. Um, but there's no, as I understand it, uh, there's, there's no real ceremony or anything like that. <laughs> uh, but it's up to you to... You know, if you want it, you can you can get it. But 
yeah, if you're going to wear something, just make sure you've actually earned it. It's kind of like anything, right? Exactly. Yeah. Now, so you've just been posted and you're now waiting for your next course, which you'll start going on the otter. What are some of the things then that you'll be learning on that course? Uh, yeah, so the course will start off with ground school where basically they'll go over the um, – the aircraft operating instructions, the way that the plane works, all the different systems, electrical, hydraulic, fuel, um, all the avionics, and basically just the uh, aircraft operating. Yeah, sorry, the, uh, you know, the, we call it the white pages and red pages. So white pages are things that uh, on the ground, like that's all your startup procedures, uh, the different things you'll do uh, in flight and then for landing and then post landing, all your different checks and things like that. And then your red pages are basically if there's an emergency or a malfunction, uh, the red ones are what you have to have memorized and able as kind of muscle memory to do right away if that situation comes up. And then you'll have yellow pages, which is all of the other malfunctions that aren't necessarily time critical that you want to pull out the checklist and really go through the checklist line by line and make sure that you deal with whatever systems malfunctioned. Um, so you learn all that on your ground school. And then you'll move on to the simulator where basically you put it all into practice and they'll throw, you know, different malfunctions and uh, training scenarios at you and, you know, uh, see how you react and how you handle it and then critique it afterwards. And then if you need to do things again or you need to pra more practice in certain areas, you'll you'll do that. And then for the Twin Otter OTU, it's only like two weeks out in uh, in Toronto where there's the only simulator for the Twin Otter in the world. And it's run by a civilian company that we go to and do it there. And then we come back to Yellowknife here and it's about 14 flights on the actual plane to get everything covered off and do all the uh, different things that you need to do in order to become qualified as a first officer. Cool. And then... From first officer, how long will it take then before you become the pilot of the aircraft? Like what, what are the next steps that you would have to take after that? Yeah. So after FO, um, you know, your next real big step is to be the AC, the aircraft commander or aircraft captain. And, um, yeah, that takes about two years, as I understand it, to upgrade. Um, so there's, as a first officer, there's all these different uh, training flights and experiences and hours you need to get on the plane. Um, you know, you could get a course uh, for us. We have uh, actual skis that we can put on the landing gear so we can land on uh, sea ice and uh, or lakes and that sort of thing when they're frozen over and there's uh, snow on them. Or uh, we have... Uh, intermediate and tundra tires where you know you can land on basically an unprepared surface so like a sandbar or a grass strip um that you know has been you know leveled out to a certain uh certain extent and would be uh would be safe to land on and there's different things that we can do to assess the conditions of where we're going to land uh one of the maneuvers that i've been told is you know a lot of fun to do is they'll actually come in and they'll touch the two main landing gear onto the landing area. And basically you'll just fly along with your nose up in the air with just the two main landing gear on it. Pop a wheelie. Yeah, basically pop a wheelie and then you'll take back off and then you'll fly around and come take a look how deep the divots in the ground are that you made and assess whether or not it's actually safe to land there and stop and then turn around and then take off again, right? That's so, crazy. Jeez. Yeah, that's that's a pretty cool one uh, that uh, is going to be a lot of fun to do. Um, so, yeah, things like that. The, the Twin Otter is really neat because it's a short takeoff and landing aircraft. So the amount of time it takes and the amount of ground roll that it needs to take off and land is a lot less than pretty much any other fixed-wing aircraft that there is, uh, especially in our fleet. And, uh, yeah, it's really, uh, it's really something else, uh, being in that, like I, I got to do a famil flight in Moose Jaw in phase two on the twin otter. And we flew over to the Moose Jaw municipal airport to come in for a landing. And I was sitting in the back and when we're coming in for, to land, I looked out the, the front of the cockpit there and all I could see was pavement. We we're basically just diving at the runway and then we landed and, you know, a couple hundred feet, we were stopped and I was like, Phew. <laughs> that's pretty cool right and the plane goes pretty slow so it's able to do these really really cool maneuvers like that and then taking off again you know it seemed like it only took a few seconds and we were airborne again so that's definitely not like 
the majority of other fixed wing aircraft. So it's it's a really cool platform, and the squadron's really awesome up here. It's it's a pretty small unit, so it's uh, it's really it's it's got a cool feel to it, which is one of the main reasons why I asked to come up here. Now, what are some of the roles and tasks that the uh, the Twin Otter has up in a uh, 440 squadron? So we're an air mobility uh, transport squadron. So our, our main job is to kind of transport people and supplies around the north to different areas and just... Uh, you know, uh, we do we do para drops where we'll have, say, the Skyhawks uh, in the back of the plane, and we'll we'll take them to go parachuting or something like that if they request it. Uh, basically, we're you know we're a service provider. We'll do whatever any other military unit uh, asks us to do if they think that we can help them out or we can we can affect some sort of uh, effect for them, right? So if they need to go to a certain part of the north and. Uh, you know, bring some supplies somewhere, some equipment, and our aircraft is suited to it. You know, they put in a request for effect, and then we'll look at it. And if we can support it, you know, we're going to do it. And uh, that's kind of our main role. Uh, you know, if the territorial uh, governments need uh, help with anything like that, they can request us as well. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. <coughs> Joint Task Force North, which is. Uh, the northern kind of military command that's up here uh if they have anything that they need us to do they'll they'll request us to help out and there's a couple exercises every exercises every year where we go out <clears throat> and participate as well sorry no 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 problem and uh yeah and we have a limited star capability um because we're we're actually quite slow <clears throat> um and our range is a little bit limited we're not exactly the best uh, search and rescue aircraft for up here in the north. Like typically they'll send out a Hercules aircraft or something like that. That has a lot more fuel, flies a lot faster, can carry a lot more supplies and they'll, they'll typically do search and rescue. But if we're requested to assist with something like that, we certainly can and we'll do whatever it is, you know, kind of that we can to help out. Okay. Um, how do you expect the Royal Canadian Air Force to adapt in the next like 10 to 15 years with uh, new threats or just new mission parameters that are going to be happening? Um, yeah, I mean, we're we're constantly evolving. We're constantly looking at new capabilities. You know, it's kind of outside my <laughs> my personal scope. Um, <clears throat> but with the people that we have, we're always adapting and. <laughs> we're always learning new things <clears throat> improving our uh, our capabilities and our readiness so you know whatever there is we'll we'll do our best to sort it out and make it work is there like a maybe a piece of tech that you've started hearing about or maybe it's going to be like coming in but you're like oh i can't wait for that to start you know maybe something's in trials right now and you think that it's like this is really going to help us with our uh, skill sets, either learning or even with uh, flying or on operations? Um, I think one of the biggest things right now is just the drone environment. The drones are, are becoming a really big part of <clears throat> any military's operations. And uh, yeah, I, I think that's going to really shape a lot of things going forward. You know, there's lots of talk of moving to unmanned aircraft um, <clears throat> I don't know if Canada is going to be doing that anytime soon. Um, uh, but you know, who knows it from my perspective, technology is awesome to a certain point. It's always really good to have, uh, you know, that human mind, that human brain in there as well. But the future is the future and who knows, right? Exactly. <laughs> things, things change constantly. So Skynet goes online all of a <laughs> yeah. sudden. You're not even flying it anymore. They got something else in there. Uh, what do you think is the biggest misconception people have about pilots and just flying in general? Um, hmm. I don't know, to be honest. Um, I think some people think that planes just land themselves. <laughs> If anything, that's when the pilot is actually earning his money, is uh, is putting it back on the ground. So <clears throat> with autopilot systems, can they land the plane themselves these days? Yes. 
but most of the airliners aren't capable of that. Some of the brand new ones are. <coughs> Sorry. I found this tickle in my throat now. Um, <clears throat> some of them are, but the pilots, you know, the, I don't think you can ever really get them out of the, out of the cockpit. You're always going to need it's, that human. You're always going to need that human in there to troubleshoot and uh, think on their feet, assess the situation, and uh, you know, do with their eyes and ears and gut are telling them. Not always just, you know, you got to follow the checklist and do all the right procedures and all that. But sometimes you have to improvise, right? So yeah. can a machine, can a computer, can an AI do that as quickly at this point in time? Probably not. I don't know. Maybe they can. Who knows? <laughs> Was there ever a course that you thought you were going to own, but it humbled you with a bit of an attitude adjustment? And what lessons did you take away from that experience? Oh, every flight course. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, I always went into it just as, uh, you know, I'm going to go, I'm going to do my best that I can see what happens. Hopefully it works out, but, uh, you know, sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. Uh, you know, that's how you approach every flight. You know, you, you go in with, you know, you're going to try your hardest. You're going to do the best job you can. And some days it just, for whatever reason, it's just not your day. And you might fail a flight and you might have to redo it. Or you might not uh, have done something as well as you did it on the previous one. So <clears throat> flying is one of those things where, you know, the very, the, the conditions are never exactly the same. So the weather's constantly changing. Other aircraft in the air, um, you know, there's there's a million things, and they can change from flight to flight, day to day. So <clears throat> you just have to be versatile, think on your feet, and just make it work, right? Yeah. <laughs> what has been the most reparty, rewarding part of your career? <clears throat> oh. mm. I don't know. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't change anything about the journey that I've had and the career that I've had. Starting out in the infantry was exactly right for me, especially in my uh, my 20s and doing it all through then. And I think I switched to the Air Force at the right time. Um, you know, I, I couldn't really pick any one single experience that, uh, you know, fully stands above the rest. I mean, the tour to Afghanistan was pretty... Uh, pretty uh instrumental in shaping kind of who i would become going forward um but yeah there's there's too many to think of and kind of <laughs> to, yeah it's too much there's there's been a lot over the last uh almost 20 years now so yeah quite the career what yeah. was the most valuable bit of <clears throat> advice you ever got from a mentor hmm Yeah, I think just uh, keep an open mind and yeah, pretty much just keep an open mind. Uh, always approach things kind of uh, knowing that, uh, you know, I don't know. Hmm. Sorry, thinking a second here. Yeah, just keep an open mind and uh, do the best job you can. Um, don't try to be always be the best. Uh, be the person that everyone will, you know, kind of look at and be like, oh yeah, he's got that covered. Like he knows his job, he knows how to do it well, and you can basically be the person that people can rely on to do the right thing, right? Mm-hmm. What was something that you saw from somebody in a leadership position that you never want to repeat when you became a leader? Um, yeah, you're definitely going to run into people with different leadership styles throughout your career. Um, there's going to be some that you're going to look at and go, hmm, you know, that's the person I want to be like or the person I want to emulate. And then there's going to be some where you're going to kind of think to yourself, you know, in that situation, but, you know, I don't really want to do that or – Maybe I wouldn't make the same choice, but at the same time, you know, you don't always know the full picture that a leader is coming from and why they're making certain decisions. 
that they are. Um, that being said, you know, the biggest thing I've found is just put your people first, take care of each other and, you know, take the time to actually talk to somebody. Like if somebody's done something wrong, like take them aside, talk to them, see what was going on, try to get to the bottom of it before you jump to conclusions and decide like, Oh, they've done this. Then we need to do this. You know, maybe there's a reason why they did what they did. And yeah, just always keep in mind that, uh, you might not actually know the full story. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that sometimes certain leaderships, they get a bit of a story and then they just jump with it. And then they've almost gotten a little too far in that conviction. They have to kind of hold that position. But I mean, yeah. I, some of the best leaders I ever had went, Oh, I, I was wrong. And you're like, yes. wow. And that being able to admit to like, sometimes an underling, like, Oh, you know what? I screwed up. You were right. It's yep. the biggest show of humility where you can be like, look, I'm not infallible. And when I am wrong, I will correct myself. Just like when you're wrong, I'm going to correct you. And I yep. think that's the most important Absolutely. thing that you can see that they also grow a bit where you go, oh, okay. Yeah. He's going to take that lesson to heart and go with it. Yeah, yeah exactly. You know, and it comes down to, yeah, just be humble. You know, you don't know everything. And, uh, you know, no matter where you're at in your career, it's important just to always, like I said, be humble and be willing to admit your own mistakes. Like everybody's human, nobody's infallible. And, uh, you know, and when people do make mistakes, you know, uh, correct them on it, but don't, you know, hold that against them. If it, especially if it's like their first time doing that thing or whatever, if people start making the same mistake again and again, and it becomes a pattern, you know, then that's getting into willful, you know, like you're doing this on purpose, like, you know, and then you can, you can deal with that as appropriately, but, uh, yeah, being a good leader, uh, listening to your subordinates and taking their perspective into account is a very important part of it. Uh, was there one piece of kit, whether issued or civvy thing that you just had to take with you on deployment or training, or even now that you're like, I cannot survive or function if I don't have blank while I'm going up. A good pair of boots. Yeah. You got to take care of your feet. Doesn't matter if you're in the Air Force oh. flying or you're in infantry on the ground. Uh, a good pair of boots that are going to stand up to whatever it is you're putting them through. You know, you if your feet are in bad shape, you're kind of useless, to be honest. So, yeah, invest in your footwear. Take care of your feet. You know, change your socks. <laughs> oh, exactly. Yeah. It's, well, I mean, you see some people that get the bad trench foot and you're like, oh, oh how'd you do this, man? Oh, like, yeah. Oh, you're going to end. Yeah. Just some of those ones. And just you're just oh. you're, you're useless at that point. Right. There's mm. yeah. If your feet aren't good, you're <laughs> you're in a bad spot. Yeah, exactly. Well, thank you Owen, so much for being on the show. It's been an absolute honor to have you on. Thanks a lot, Brian. Appreciate it. Perfect. All right. Thank you for watching. Till next time, have yourself a great day. Bye. Thanks for your time. Please like, subscribe, and comment to help grow the show. And remember, get back up.